Good afternoon. I'm adjunct professor Janice Bell. I'm a GP from Western Australia and I am the Thank you. Chief Executive Officer at WAGPET. And we did a piece of work to try and understand what happened with our registrars when they left our time uh, with us. And this encouraged South Australia, and then Victoria, and then Tasmania, and then Northern Territory. It was a bit like, if you've watched Lord of the Rings, the lighting of the beacons. And gradually, we've added more and more to this study in both a qualitative and a quantitative way. Today, I'm only going to talk to you about the quantitative work across WA and South Australia, because that is the most robust data we have. But we'll be back for Rama 19, and we'll give you the phase two and phase three qualitative work, and include the work from Victoria, Tasmania, and hopefully Northern Territory. Um, I'm also here in a sort of a de facto sense. Uh, Professor Caroline Lawrence did this work. We um, ran this completely independently. And I'm sure many of you have wondered whether your programs have any impact or not. And so we sat with uh, chewing our fingernails for some time, uh, waiting to see what the results would be. But the main question we wanted to ask ourselves is, do registrars stay rural when they've finished their AGPT? And so we looked at all registrars who had got their fellowship between 2010 and 2016. And we compared where they were in their training time with where they were on the APRA data. Um, we were able to follow up some 98% of our doctors in that setting, so there weren't very many who'd left medicine. And this study shows you what's going on across two states. They were very slightly different, but the overall trends and findings were very similar. This is very small for you, but basically we, oh, Caroline, went and had a look at the research. And I must say, this was triggered a little bit by some um, early uh, editorial pieces, such as in the MJA, saying, oh, well, you know, really, does the AGBT make very much of a difference? We don't see any evidence that it does. I've been around this industry long enough that when people start saying that, you start to get a little bit nervous. Um, because suddenly there's some change in government policy which may not actually be evidence-based. So we thought we would do this work. And so we went back and had a look at the what exists so far. And there's quite a lot, but it didn't actually really apply to rural general practice. So quite a lot of work on whether people stayed rural or not, but not specifically with uh, general practice. And many of the studies were very small. And some of you will recognise yourselves in that work. So we had 762 graduates, which was 98%, as I said, of our total number. And uh, those of you who are more statistically uh, able than me will understand uh, bivariate and univariate analysis and using multivariable logistic regression model of current practice, location, and various covariates, training and demographics. I just wanted to know whether we'd had an impact or not, but apparently it's all very solid in terms of the statistics. So this was a surprise to us in many ways. So if I just go through this slide, because I think this is the one that um, kind of tells the story. So what we found when we were trying to understand were our graduates still working in a rural area, anywhere between one and six, seven years later, we found some very, very strong predictors. And the first was the number of full-time equivalent weeks they'd spent training in the AGPT. So much so that for every 10 weeks, 
there was a 21 in, 21% increase in likelihood they would still be rural post training. Doing an advanced special skills post, incredibly important, uh, and lots of um, support for the rural journalist model and approach. Uh, nearly three times more likely to stay rural if they'd done an advanced skill. Nearly twice as likely if they're Australian born, and twice as likely if they're an Australian medical graduate. And unsurprisingly, if they're a rural bonded scholarship, <laughs> the odds were quite high that they would be still training rurally some years later. The no difference was interesting as well. Now remember this is just on quantitative data and we don't know until we do, well we have done phase two and phase three so it's some fairly good ideas but at this stage this is just the raw facts. So we found gender made no difference. We found age made no difference which is really intriguing. You've probably heard a lot of anecdotes I'm not a fan of anecdotes. If any of you have heard me speak before, I prefer evidence. Um, you know, if they're mature age, they're not going to go rural, they're not going to uproot their families, so forth and so on. We didn't find that. Didn't find it with, with um, male or female, didn't find it with age. We didn't find it with a moratorium, which was also surprising. So it does go to show that um, as long as people are actually training in a rural area, uh, the AGPT is very, very sticky. It's more sticky if you're an Australian medical graduate, but not only an Australian medical graduate. PGPPP placements didn't make any difference, so they weren't leading people to stay rural post their AGPT training. Um, small numbers, of course, before PGPP got um, disbanded, but nevertheless no um, no evidence found there. And rural clinical school experience didn't turn out to be a um, variable either, and that surprised us a lot. It showed up in a univariate analysis, but once you took into account other things uh, that fell out of the statistical modelling as not, as not significant. The type of curriculum, it didn't matter whether you did a FACRAM or a FRACGP or an FRACGP plus FARGP, made no difference whatsoever. And similarly, the curriculum didn't make any difference. And the time since graduation, we did look at that because you might say, well, how can you compare someone who's been out one year with someone who's been out six years? It made no difference. So pretty interesting stuff. And the first time anyone's looked at where were they when they left training? Where are they now? What does it mean? And I'm sure you're wondering the same thing. So we've got a lot to try and understand this. This is just a piece of data. We can draw hundreds of hypotheses uh, from it that need to be tested, and that's what we're doing. So first of all, um, at this stage, we're looking at their locations um, after training, and we are fairly happy, and I see Bill Coote in the back uh, stalls there. I think Bill will be fairly happy too that the AGPT actually has done what it was set out to do. Uh, we're very lucky we don't have the same sort of challenges when our registrars leave us. They're in a training practice, uh, they're happy hopefully, and they stay. We don't have the same sort of pressures of people having to return back to the city or whatever. We do know that therefore the AGPT is contributing to workforce imbalances because the AGPT has a 50-50 distribution of GP registrars, and that's where they are when they um, finish their training. And we do know that giving people rural exposure is incredibly important, and that the advanced skills make a really, really significant difference. So there's a real challenge for all of us, I think, to make sure that there are enough high quality uh, advanced skills posts around. Uh, as I said, the, the fact about the registrars themselves, in terms of those gross um, characteristics, not a major impact, uh, but certainly something like a bonded scholarship for a very, very small number does have a dramatic effect. So obviously there's lots of limitations, lots of questions, lots of things for us to uh, think through. Good news is it was a very, very uh, large sample of doctors we were able to access. So uh, while I'm not a qualified uh, researcher, I 
um, I know what a, what, a, what a sample size of 762 or 98% stands for. ARPRA data may not be accurate. Those of you who have played with ARPRA data, maybe people gave us their residential address rather than their practice address. That wouldn't actually bother me too much if it's still in the country. Um, self-reported data, well, we don't have a lot of self-reported data in this one, but um, it's worth bearing in mind. And one of the things which we didn't collect was rural origin. So that's been taken up in phase two. And I can report that rural origin does make a difference in the, uh, in the phase two study. So the next steps, as I said, um, and so this title was slightly misleading for all of you who've come in from Victoria and uh, Tasmania and Northern Territory. The data isn't solid enough, and the reason is that uh, those uh, Northern Territory and Tasmania came on much later. And also in Victoria, there's a bit of a challenge because between 2010 and 2016, the RTOs all changed. And uh, it was hard enough for South Australia. And my colleague here, uh, Chris Cook, who came on board very quickly, found trying to get the data from an ex-RTO was not as easy as, as it was for us in WA. But it is coming, and uh, that what we've seen so far mirrors completely what we've found here so far. So, just to recognise the various people who have helped us and uh, continue to help us in this work. Thank you. Happy to take any questions. And I have Chris Cook here. I have Greg McMeal. I think I saw Greg somewhere. Oh, no, I'm going to get one from you. Greg's here as well. So, David. Okay. You, you're, yes. You're right. That's cool. <coughs> Is the sample all registrars or rural registrars? Only? All, all registrars. All registrars. So that's good. Um, but that means it's only half of that sample when you're looking at what contributes to it. The the key thing, I'm a, I'm a head of a rural clinical school, so I want to challenge the data um, because uh, it doesn't match with the large number of different studies on rural clinical schools and their effect on rural workforce. We all agree on rural origin as being a key feature. The problem is correlation of variables. So if you put them in a logistic regression model, which is what you've used here, if the variables are correlated, then you lose that when you put multiple things in the model. So if rural clinical students are more likely to choose to do rural general practice, then when you put the model together, one of the variables can drop out. And it doesn't mean it didn't have an influence, it's just the influence was part of the causal pathway. So that's Correct. my theory. <laughs> Correct. Happy to, ta happy to take that. But we're, d we're doing a lot more work on that specific issue. And as I said, on a, as a variable on its own, it was significant. Was it significant in WA? Was it significant for South Australia or not? Not for you, but for us. Okay. Don't tell David that. <laughs> Uh, g'day, my name's Mike from General Practice Training Queensland. I'm a rural GP as well. Uh, I just had a question about, you mentioned the PGPP having no effect. I was just wondering if you looked at the John Flynn program as well, considering it's much more sort of rurally focused. That's an excellent idea. I don't know whether we've taken that up in phase two or phase three. Thank you for that. Really good, really good thought. Well, I think all those Can you grab John that, Chris? PGPP, they're all kind of a causal pathway. So. Yeah, you know, it may well be that they all link together, but it'll be very hard to actually tease out which one has, you know, if one has a smaller influence and another has a larger influence, you'll be struggling to tease that out with those multiple things in the same pathway. Taryn. Yeah, thanks, Torrin Sengupta, so James Cook University. And I agree with David's point, absolutely. It's all part of a recipe. If you're making a cake, you don't say one part is more important than another. You know, they're all important. So I think that's very important to recognise that. And if you had one... Uh, I know, intervention and other pieces really weak, you might not get the outcome. Um, did you have any indication of the absolute numbers or proportions? In other words, how many people were actually in remaining rural practice at one year, three year, and what that was compared to the baseline? In other words, what difference you might have made? But what baseline are you talking about? Well, what the number was like before. Uh, what, what I'm really wondering is oh, okay. what proportion of graduates or how many were actually in rural practice? And what might you have expected, you know, uh, there was always going to be a number in rural practice, so what difference do you think the, the, the rural pathway or the, or the rural programs made? What we did in WA is we compared the distribution of all GPs, 
with the distribution of the GP registrars who fellowed 2010 to 2016. I think that's your best proxy. And that included those registrars. And there was a significant difference in the distribution. I can talk a bit more about this for WA, where, um, because there's been a number of things like, oh, well, you know, rural, what's rural? Um, they all leave four and five and go to two and three. They don't, not in WA and not in, and not in South Australia. It's, these are some things we've taken on further. Um, and there was also some shift from urban to rural as well as rural to urban, but it was very, very sticky. And it probably isn't surprising if you think about it, and that's what we've looked at in phase two and phase three, is the experience in the practice is incredibly important in terms of its stickiness. And so we saw a lot of, because what WAGPET then did is we, in, we rang up every single one of our um, 400 uh, registrars, because we were fascinated by the results, thank you. And uh, we thought, you know, all the usual things you hear, flexibility, part-time, time off with the family, the beach, that isn't what people said as to why they were what they were. They were there because of the practice. They felt supported, uh, they felt that they could get teaching and experience beyond um, their fellowship years. And so that's the part that I think is really telling for us, is it's that quality and experience in the practice, that's why they stay. Last one. Can I just ask, what's the definition of rural origin? So if you, say, go to primary school... It's the classic, it's the classic one, the five years, the same one that is used for the universities. So what, what is that distance? David will tell is? you. Oh, no, I can't. And it's, it's, it's five years between the years of this yeah, and... Yeah, it, it was like that for that period. And yeah. the, last, the last couple of years it's changed again, but it was five years in a rural area in that formative state. In the, in the, before leaving school. Yeah. That's what we used. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.